Today we're going to take a look at another one of the lures uh, that Christians are often tempted by. The thing that looks exciting, looks good on the outside, but it's something that can really be deadly and really get its hooks into us. And today what we're going to take a look at is peer pressure. I wonder what you think about just when you hear that term, peer pressure. Uh, maybe you think, oh yeah, that's that thing for teens, right? That's, uh, right? Do it because everyone else is doing it, right? That's uh, something for teenagers, right? But I think, if we're honest, it's something that we all face. We could call it peer pressure, we could call it social pressure, but it's the influence that the people around us have on us to live a certain way um, that's acceptable to those people around us, right? It's the influence those people have on us to make us act or live or speak a certain way because of how those people think about it. Uh, if you don't think that you are affected by peer pressure or social pressure. Just think about how you dress and how you cut your hair and present yourself right, to people. I doubt that what you're wearing today, it, you chose it because it's the most comfortable thing out of all the clothes that exist. Um, there's probably a part of it that's affected by what society thinks and what society deems appropriate and what society thinks is attractive or in style right now. Right? Like, there's literally no reason why I should be wearing this. Right? There's no function to it, but right, it's part of kind of social pressure, peer pressure. Uh, and so it's not all bad. Right? But I think we can be honest that we're all influenced by it in different ways. If you just think of um, different like fashion fads for the past few decades, right? You can you could probably think of some, some specific things that people wore, and you could look back and say, there's no other reason that someone would wear that except by right, social pressure. Maybe you think of like the, they call it a Canadian tuxedo, right, which is jeans with the jean jacket, like jean everything. Maybe you think of like Ugg boots. Um, I mean, you could probably think of a few examples. I wish I would have put a picture up of this, but there, and you can search my Facebook page if you want to find it. Um, but there was a time in my life where I thought sweater vests were just the thing, you know? Um, that was how to look cool. And, um, in addition to that, I had, you know, when the hair was kind of shaggy, I had a sort of like, and I had glasses at the time, so it was sort of like a Velma from Scooby-Doo look I had going on. Um, but now, I, I, I don't think that vests are all that. Uh, I, I'm more in line with what the comedian Dimitri Martin says, where he says vests are all about protection, right? Bulletproof vests protect us from bullets. Life vests protect us from drowning. And sweater vests protect us from pretty girls. Um, <laughs> Just goes to show, right, we're all affected by this peer pressure, this social pressure, and it's not always a bad thing, but it's there, right, it's there. And we're going to take a look today at what kind of pressures we face as Christians, and how do we react to them, right, how do we live as citizens of our culture, and yet as members of a family, you know, and an allegiance that we have that's higher, right, to God more than it is to our culture. In order to take a look at this, we're going to study a portion of God's word from Exodus. We're going to study the story of the golden calf. And maybe, as you hear that that's the story we're going to study, I kind of you raise an eyebrow and think, well, what does that have to do with peer pressure? And I'll be honest, that was my first reaction too. Right? When I saw it in the worship plans coming up, and I, I looked at it, I'm like, is that a mistake? Uh, what does the golden calf have to do with peer pressure? Uh, but I think our study today will be eye-opening, and I think we will learn a lot about uh, how we are affected by the pressures of the culture around us by studying this story. So let's take a look at Exodus chapter 32. Uh, we're going to read it in two chunks. I'm going to read verses 1 to 10 to start. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the camp and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people, whom you brought out of Egypt, have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them, and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it, and have sacrificed to it, and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone, so that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. This is God's word. Here's a picture to kind of help us think about the scene that's happening here. Um, in order for us to really understand the role that peer pressure plays in this story, there's a few details um, I think we need to take a look at. And first of all, you, you look at it, and it's just it's kind of a sad story. Um, just sin. I mean, think of the situation these people are in. God has just recently brought them out of Egypt in a miraculous way by his powerful hand, literally using miracles, right, to, to bring the people out, to bring them through the Red Sea, to protect them from the Egyptian army. Like, they haven't seen God physically, but they've seen him at work, no doubt. And, and just before this happens, like, about 40 days or less before this happens, they actually had a chance to hear the voice of God. Moses goes up the mountain once, and he, he brings back a message, and they actually get to hear God speaking to them. And God makes them a promise that they're going to be his special people, that they're going to be chosen, his chosen nation. And they get to hear that from God. Not to mention, probably this very morning, there was literally food falling from the heavens for them to eat. Maybe the night before, there was quail for them to eat that came from God. And yet, they bow down to something that they made out of their jewelry. Something that they, they probably could have seen Aaron crafting it with the tool, and yet, they still bow down to it and claim that this was the God that brought them up out of Egypt and said. Did you notice what their worship service looked like? Some of the details will help us understand what's really going on. Uh, the offerings or the sacrifices that they gave, they were named two different ones that they used. There were burnt offerings and there were fellowship offerings. Uh, these were not just generic sacrifices. These were, these were specific sacrifices meant for the Israelite people to give to the real God. And yet they were bringing them to this false God. You also heard maybe Aaron, he, he said, uh, let's proclaim a festival to the Lord. Right, so there's, there's some worship of the true God going on here. But obviously, you look at the image and you say, well, well, that's not just worship of the true God. There's something else going on there. Uh, if you look at the image there, the, the calf or the young bull, uh, where did they get that from? What God is that? Well, uh, religions throughout, and false gods throughout history, uh, a handful have taken the form of a, of a bull. Uh, but the most likely one that we believe this to be would be the god Apis. <coughs> He's an Egyptian god, a god of power and sex. And so, right, the Israelites had just been in Egypt. No doubt they had seen worship of this god happen before. They liked the fact, right, that the people around them could worship something that they could see or it's right there in front of them. And I bet, right, this is the god of power and sex, that worship was a little different from how they worshiped the, the true god. And you maybe heard that, they said they, they sat down to eat and drink, and they got up to, and I'll use air quotes, indulge in revelry, which I think was is a, kind of a, a euphemism for talking about the, the type of, again, I'll say in air quotes, worship um, that they would be doing to this God. What was happening? That They were not just participating in idol worship, it was a, a mixing of religions. It's what we would call syncretism. Right? That's when you, you mix two religions or mix two religious practices together. Right? This is syncretism. They wanted to have like a worship of the true God, but they also wanted to have the cool stuff that they saw the nations around them doing. Right? To have a God that they could see, to have worship that was a little bit more exciting, a little bit more sensual. Like They didn't want to miss out on that stuff. And so what we see in this sad scene is that the Israelites, you know, they heard that they're God's special people, but it's kind of like they were saying, well, we want to be God's special people, but we also want to be like all the other people. We don't want to miss out on all the cool stuff that they're doing. And sadly, this, uh, this was not going to be the last time that this happens. 
this would be uh, an absolute trap, an absolute lure to the people of Israel for their, for their history. I mean, you look at the, the darkest times in Israel's history, and it's, and it's because they caved to the idol worship of the peoples around them. Just to give you a few uh, examples, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, that's Moses' farewell sermon before these people are going to go into the promised land uh, that God has told them, you know, it's going to be yours. Before they go in there, Moses has one last chance to give his farewell sermon, to give them some advice, right? If they go into this land of Canaan, a place that's going to have lots of other cultures, lots of other gods, and he gives them the law one more time, and then he, he just gives them some great words of advice. And I just want to show you just a few of the things that he mentions. Don't worship their gods. Don't worship God, the true God, at pagan worship sites. So maybe more of that danger of mixing the religions together. Don't intermarry with other religions. Right? Uh, don't be influenced by the people around you. And maybe we see this one and we think, ooh, that seems, seems kind of severe. But if you take a look at, at Israel's history, that right there was the downfall of, of many kings and uh, true believers in God. Is that they, they married someone who had different gods, and then they left the true God behind, to follow these false gods. He also says, cut down and destroy their worship places and items. Don't follow their gods. Don't be enticed by them. He spends a lot of time talking about peer pressure. Talking about the influence of the peoples around them. Sadly, they don't need the warning. And you hear Joshua uh, at the end of his ministry saying nearly the same thing. They've had the chance to now go into the promised land. They've, they've done some of the conquest stuff, but they haven't done it fully yet. And so Joshua's about to die, right? The next leader, he's about to die. And he tells, he has a chance to talk to the people before he dies. And what does he talk about? The same thing. Uh, let me show you what his words are. He says this, Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them. But you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. Uh, in the same section, this is the part where you hear that famous passage where he says, you know, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And that's the context where that comes in, where he's talking about serving God versus being influenced by the, the other cultures around them and, and associating with them. And then he gives this warning. It says this, uh, but if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your backs and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Pretty severe warning. Sound a lot like a lure to you. Right? They're going to be a trap for you. They're going to be thorns to you. Something that will hook into you. It will be a constant pain and a constant problem for you. He makes it very clear that the, the, the pressure of your society and your culture around you, you've got, to, you've got to have your eyes open to it. And you can't just think that you, you can just, well, I'm just going to take in all these cultures around me and I'll be totally fine. And I won't let them influence me. The book after Joshua is Judges, and Judges is perhaps one of the darkest times, darkest times in Israel's history, where because they don't expel the people from the land, and they do intermarry with them, and they do associate with them, it's the cycle of idolatry and the cycle of sin, and always going after other gods and not really remaining faithful to the Lord. And what Joshua says is exactly what happens. It's a total trap. Or lure for them. And it, it nearly destroys them. God wants us to, to be aware of the, the pressure, the social pressure around us. And God doesn't take this lightly, what happens here. This angers God. Seriously angers God. And if you could kind of put yourself in his shoes, it absolutely makes sense. I mean, you think of everything that God has done for these people. 
You think of the promise he's just made to them, that they're going to be his special people. I mean, I think we take that for granted a little bit. A God that makes promises to us. Right? If, you, if you didn't know anything about Christianity and you imagine there was an all-powerful God out there, which way do you expect the promises to be going? <laughs> Usually, if there's an all-powerful God, I'm probably making promises to him. Right? I'm promising to fix up my life. I'm promising to do this or that so that he'll bless me or something. But we have a God that makes promises to us. That decides to make a promise and he says, I'm going to hold myself to it. Right? But we have God that makes promises to us. And he had made promises to these people. And he said, you're going to be my special people. And what the Israelites did is they just turned around and basically slapped him in the face. Like they were saying, you know, yeah, we're, we're your special people. But, but we want to be like those people too. I know you set us apart, but we don't really want to be set apart. We kind of just want to be like everybody else. We face that too. Right? The, the pressure to want to be like everybody else. God says, you're my special people. You say, that's great, right? I love that Jesus loves me, but is that really mean? I can't do that anymore? Peer pressure. Social pressure, right? That's what we face. And it doesn't please God. Uh, I want to read to you God's words to Moses. Um, after, after seeing this happen, here's, here's what God says. says. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses. And they are stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger. Relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster it threatened. God is pretty honest with Moses about how he feels about this. And I think at this moment, God is uh, kind of putting Moses to the test. Giving him an opportunity to, to step up as a leader and to plead for his people. And what Moses does here is beautiful. And it's actually a great example for us. What he does is he leans on the promises that God has made. He leans on God's character. And he says, God, you promised. God, you promised that we were going to be your special people, right? You, you promised to Abraham, to Isaac, to Israel, and, and I need you to keep your, your promises because you, you promised to. And not only is this a beautiful scene and a, and a great example, but more importantly, uh, Moses is a great picture of Christ, of what Jesus does for us. Moses, standing before God, right? Asking God not to destroy the people that so deserve it, right? He doesn't say, well, well, it wasn't that bad, right? See, there was a little bit of worship in you going on, too. No, that's not the case he makes at all, right? He leans on the promises of God, leans on God's compassion, holds him to the mercy that he says he will have. He's a great picture of Christ. Uh, I want to read to you from Romans chapter 8 that, that talks about uh, what Jesus does for us, how he is this... Uh, that he intercedes for us. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Uh, this is what Jesus does for us. Uh, when we would deserve for God to destroy us, when we would deserve for, for us not to be God's special people anymore, uh, when we would deserve to be punished, what Jesus does is he stands before the Father and he says, you promised. Right? You promised that when you sent me into this world, I was going to die for the sins of the world. 
And when Jesus came, he came to take your punishment and my punishment. He came to be destroyed so that God would not destroy you. He came to be punished so that God would no longer punish you. And so the picture that God gives us right, is, is of Jesus interceding before the Father on our behalf. He is our lawyer. He is the one who stands in the courtroom and says, this person is not guilty. Because I died for them. So I gave my life on the cross for them. Because of what we sinned, because their sins were nailed to the cross with me. So Jesus stands there in our place. He steps in. Because we'd be destroyed on our So that God then can say this about us. But you are a chosen people royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That, that that's how God sees you, that that's who you are, right? that, that you're his special people. So what does this mean for your life? I mean, you take a look at the what happens with the worship of the golden calf. And, you know, going to your homes, I, I doubt I'm going to find um, idol worship going on, right? I doubt I'm going to find a statue to Apis or Buddha or Allah or some other god. So what's the, what's, what's the lesson, right? What, what, what do we learn from this? I mean, God hasn't asked us to separate from our culture like he did the Israelites. Right? That's not a command he gives us. Uh, in fact, in uh, John 17, right before Jesus is about to die, he prays this for his disciples and for future believers, for us. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of them. Um, Jesus isn't praying that we totally separate ourselves from the world. He doesn't ask us to be monks or ascetics, right, where we say this world is so sinful, I'm just going to live apart from it, right? quarantine myself from the sin of the world and just live apart from it, and I'll pray to God and worship him on my own, but I'll just detach from my culture. And that kind of forgets all the things that God says about serving your neighbor, showing a unique love, being a light to the world, going and telling all nations about Jesus, right? So God doesn't want us to completely separate from our culture. And yet God does want us to be different. He does. Right? The life of a Christian should look different from the world around us. It should not look the same. And that's hard for us. That's a challenge. Because with that peer pressure, that social pressure uh, that we feel, we don't want to be different. Right? We don't want to stick out as weird, as odd, as, as strange. We don't want people to think that we're unkind, uncaring, or uncool. That's, that's what peer pressure is, right? Is that, that pressure to, to conform and just to be like everyone else. But God doesn't want you to be like everyone else. But that's the temptation, right? And I think you, you can probably see it in your life. Um, I'll, I'll give you a few, a few examples of how it's a temptation for me. And I'm curious, you know, if some of you feel this, this similar temptation. Uh, are, are we tempted to, uh, to kind of just with the things that God says in his word that aren't so popular in our culture, to kind of just keep quiet about those things. Right? Like you can think of certain passages, certain teachings that, you know, if the world knew that our church taught that, they'd probably think that we're pretty unkind and pretty unloving and pretty strange. Right? If I talked about that, if I, if I lived like that, I'd be a weirdo. And so maybe I'll just kind of keep quiet about that. Well, I'll, I'll still believe it, but I won't really live it. Uh, maybe it's our, our culture's views on marriage, sexuality, gender, pleasure, work, relationships, our time versus using our time for God or for other people. Uh, there's a lot of ways, right, that we don't want to stand up. We don't want to be different. And I think the danger is that we're not necessarily going to worship idols like the Israelites did. But do we sometimes practice a subtle syncretism? A mixing of the worship of the true God with the worship of American values. And what our culture, our culture values. 
Do we sometimes like swallow whole our culture and say, well, this is just what my culture does, and I'm just going to go along with it, and we kind of blindly take it all in without thinking, is this really what God wants me to do? Is this really the way God wants me to live? Are these the values that God would, would have me have? Because that's the danger, right, of the social pressure around us, that it happens sometimes unseen. And we just find ourselves just kind of going along with everything else without thinking. Is this, is this healthy for me? Is this the life God wants me to live? Am I being the light that he wants me to be? Am I showing the love he wants me to show? Or am I just, you know, somebody looks at, looked at my life, they, I just look like anybody else. Friends, that's the challenge. Right? And God wants us to be different. He doesn't want us to be like everyone else. And I think this passage from... Uh, from Galatians, from the Apostle Paul, is a great um, encouragement for us. He says this, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings, or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. And that's really the heart of it. That as a Christian, your greatest allegiance is to Christ. Right? He is the thing that makes you tick. He is the thing that helps you get up in the morning and not be absolutely depressed and have no hope. Like he is the thing that gives your life hope and meaning and fills you with love and fills you with value. He is the thing that makes you go. Your allegiance, your primary allegiance is not to your culture. It's not to what uh, people on Twitter say. It's not to what your followers say. It's not to what the people at work or the people around you say. Your allegiance is to Christ first. And anything that gets in the way of that, we can be done. Our allegiance is to Christ. And I think a lot of times in thinking about being different, right, as a, as a Christian, we think of it as like a negative, or as that we're going to stick out as weird, or we're going to miss out on something, but I think God would actually have us see it as a positive. How, how could sticking out as a Christian be a, a good thing, a positive thing? Maybe it means that as people look at your life, you're not like everybody else. Because you show a unique love that's not as conditional or transactional as what people are used to. That, you know, why do you forgive so freely? Well, because God made me different. Because I have a Savior that's different from all of this. Why do you spend your time the way you do? Why do you spend so much time helping out other people? Why don't you spend you know, so much time going on vacations like everybody else? How come you're giving so much of your time to other people? You know, maybe, it's, maybe it's okay to be a little weird for God, to be a little odd, to be a little different, because that's a conversation piece. That's a chance for somebody to ask, you know, why are you so different? And you have a chance to tell them about the God who makes you promises. The God who, who stands in front of the, the destroying force that we deserve and takes it for us. Not only that, but uh, I think we maybe you think of us being different or strange, and it's not because God wants you just to be a weirdo or to have to suffer in some way, but do you ever think that maybe it's to protect you? That when, when, when God pulls you a little bit out of your culture, and a little bit away from those things that he might, he might just be pulling you out of what's killing you. Maybe he's, he's telling you to live a little bit apart from the thing that could destroy your life and your relationship with him. Maybe it's because God, you know, when he gives us his law and he encourages us towards holy living, maybe that's actually better for you. In fact, it is. It is. And this navigating our culture uh, is not going to be an easy thing. Because right? God still wants us to be a part of our culture. He wants us to be a light. He wants us to show love. He wants us to tell other people the good news. And yet, he doesn't want us to conform. In fact, there's a, a great passage from uh, Romans chapter 12. It says, uh, do not conform to the pattern of this world. But be transformed. 
God doesn't want us just to conform to our culture, but he wants us to be transformed and in turn then transform the lives of others. This will be a challenge. You will continue to face this pressure until the day you die because you live in a culture that doesn't always value what God values. But God has given us an awesome opportunity to be different, to reach the world with a unique love, with a unique hope, with a unique promise that isn't found anywhere else. So let's go to that God in prayer and ask that he keep his promises. Dear God, please forgive us. Uh, we have uh, too often just gone along with our culture without thinking. We have at times held as more important the values of our culture and our society. We've been afraid to be identified as Christians, and we've been wanting to just go along with what everyone else is doing and, and forgive us. It's pathetic, it's sad, and it's sinful when we put things in front of you, so we need your forgiveness. And we, got, we ask you, God, that you keep your promises. That when we confess our sins, you're faithful, you're just. That you forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So, God, we ask that you keep your promise to us and forgive us of those sins. God, we also pray that you give us wisdom and boldness. Uh, being a part of our culture and yet being set apart is going to be a challenge for us every day. So, we pray that you give us confidence to do that to not be afraid of sticking out. And when you give us the opportunity, when we stand out, help us to take advantage of that, to be willing to talk about you, even when it will make us seem strange or weird. God, help us to do it, uh, because you've given us something that has transformed our lives and can transform the lives of others. Help us not to be afraid of that, but to have our total hope and confidence and allegiance and trust in you. In your name we pray.